Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would so work in our hearts as we look together at the truth, the principles, the commands of your word, and you would so work in us that we would grow in all that it means to become a, a good and faithful servant, a good, faithful, authentic follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this for your glory, in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Splendid. Well, there's lots in this passage. We're not going to plumb all its depths, but I'm going to bring out four pictures that I think we see in here of what it means to be a, a faithful Christian worker or Christian leader as well. Firstly, that of being a servant. Secondly, that of being a faithful steward. Thirdly, that of being a spectacle. And fourthly, sadly, I couldn't find a word, a single word beginning with S, but that doesn't matter. Fourthly, family love demonstrated. We see all these pictures in, in this passage. As Christians, of course, we're called to be servants. Servants first and foremost to God, but also to one another, to the family of, of believers. I read this a while ago. Years ago, the Salvation Army was holding an international convention and their founder, General William Booth, probably towards the end of his life, he couldn't attend because of physical weakness and illness. So he tele telegraphed a, his convention message to them. It was just one word. Others. Others. Servanthood is stressed in verse 1 where Paul says, So then people ought to regard us as servants of Christ. But let's look a bit deeper. When we look at the original meaning of the word Paul used for servant here, it gives us a much deeper and fuller understanding. What it truly means to be a servant of Christ. For the word, word Paul used meant under rower or galley slave. Those who were chained to their bench, um, who we, we knew as galley slaves, men whose work was unrelenting and incredibly hard, uh, who'd be subject to the whip if their overseers thought they were slacking at all. Um, their time, indeed their very lives, weren't their own. Uh, if, if that was uh, the terms and conditions of a, a, a job application these days, I'm not sure it would attract many, if any, applicants at all. Uh, but there it is. There it is. This is the meaning of the word Paul uses in describing himself and his co-workers and really us as well down through the ages. So anyone willing... Or, sorry, anyone calling themselves a believer in and a follower of Christ must grasp this meaning and what it means for our life. It should remind us of Jesus' command in Luke 9, 23 and elsewhere in the Gospels where he says that if anyone would come after me, he must, she must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. In Matthew 16, 25, he says, we must lose our lives to find our lives in him. Galley slaves, of course, they didn't have a choice. But we, as believers, willingly surrender our life to Christ. And in so doing, we find him and we find true life, life in abundance now and, of course, for all eternity. We must never consider any task is too low for us. We ever think this way, uh, and if we should, we should just stop and think of the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who was willing to wash the feet, that most lowly of tasks, to wash the feet of, of his friends. And of course, beyond that, of being a spectacle on the cross in front of other people. Um, our ex perfect, our supreme example. So when we're faced with the truths of what it means to be an authentic disciple of Christ, some may humbly and prayerfully accept this. Hopefully they will. Hopefully we have uh, in willing surrender. But others may find this cost just too high and fall away. Such folk may very well be attracted to the saving message of the gospel and be drawn to the beauty of the Lord Jesus, 
but in their hearts they still want a foot in two camps. Full surrender, it's, it's just too much. And quoting in 1 John um, verse three, sorry, chapter 3, verse 1, such folk probably haven't grasped just how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And he then goes on to confirm this awesome reality by saying, for those who truly believe in Jesus, John goes on to say, and that is what we are. That is what we are. And such individuals haven't also considered and appreciated the enormity of the price paid to redeem us from the sin and the control of the devil. And again, from 1 John chapter 3, this time in verse 16, goes on to say, this is how we know what love is. That is God's love for us, of course. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And of course, in the light of this, we could think of the better known 316 from John's gospel this time. But God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And it takes to, to Jesus' death on the cross and taking the punishment we deserve was that he literally became a sin offering on our behalf, the holy, spotless, pure, eternal son of the living God took my sin and yours on his body. Now we can grasp the, to some degree the terrible suffering from the physical torture he endured and the shame of the cross, of being despised, rejected and abandoned but of the terrible suffering of him taking our sin on his body. We can barely begin to appreciate, save that we know it was terrible indeed, beyond words. God's amazing grace is free, but it's far from cheap. It's far from cheap. So anyone who thinks perhaps they're in this latter group should come before God in repentance and ask him to so work in their hearts to help them understand the fullness of Christ's work on the cross and to help them to surrender their, their lives to him. Nothing is more important. And if that's you here today or watching online, then please, please feel free to speak to any of us at the church and we will gladly seek to meet you where you're at and help you on this faith journey. From the moment we become believers in Christ to the time we meet in glory, it is a journey. It's a wonderful journey. And we need one another to help us as well. So don't procrastinate, for today is the day of salvation. Now as part of the picture of being a servant of Christ, we can know wonderful freedom from the, that of pursuing a reputation. We see how Paul uh, had this freedom. If you turn to verses 3 and 4 again with me. And this is Paul speaking. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges. Pleasing men, gaining a reputation, wasn't Paul's aim. After his primary aim, primary aim rather, of serving God, Paul sought to sacrificially serve the church, but in no way to be a people pleaser or seek to impress others. Now we can expect people of the unbelieving world to seek a reputation and the approval of others, but many, and many Christian folks sometimes fall foul of this as well. But it is so foolish. Seeking a reputation... It's like chasing the wind. You may seemingly catch it, but then it's gone. It's gone. Our house of cards eventually comes tumbling down, or as Jesus put it at the end of Matthew 7, our house built on sand falls down because it had no solid foundation, the foundation that is Jesus himself. So why do Christians fall into this trap of sometimes pursuing a reputation or the constant approval of others? And I've been there in, in the past as well. I need freedom from this. I think two main drivers, there's probably others, but two main drivers are pride and, and feelings of insecurity or inadequacy. So we need to check ourselves on that first point. Like David at the end of Psalm 139, ask God 
Ask his spirit to search our hearts. Show us what's offensive there. And if he shows us that pride in our hearts is a primary driver in this area, then of course we repent and we ask God to remove this sin from us. For sure in my life I've certainly had my share of pride and of boasting of things I have or have achieved. Um, But the second part of verse 7 has really pulled me up short on this. If you look at verse 7, the second part, it reads, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? Well, probably many of us are familiar with 2 Timothy 3.16, which tells us that all scripture is from God. But it goes on to tell us that it's useful for teaching, uh, for rebuking, correcting, and training. Now, all of us, all believers, should be very grateful for the teaching and training, but also for the rebuke of God. For we will need that frequently. The rebuke of God through his word, and thankfully, in his mercy, his correction as well. And verse 7, or that second part of verse 7, has certainly rebuked me at times, and rightly so, and rightly so. But what are feelings of being, of, of inadequacy or insecurity? Christians certainly aren't immune to those feelings either. So we constantly need to remember and remind one another that they were all sinners and broken people in Christ We are a redeemed people. We are God's precious possession. And he loves us with an immeasurable and an unending love. We cannot and don't need to make him love us any more than he already does. We don't need to impress him. He knows us as we are. He knows all the sins we've committed. All of them. Yet he loves us nonetheless. He loves us nonetheless. Uh, Philippians 1.6 tells that those who are in Christ tells us that he has begun a transforming work in us and he is continuing it and thankfully he will complete it. And related to that, 1 John chapter 3 again, verse 2 tells of this completion. It, it reads, verse 1 assures us rather that we are children of God as I mentioned earlier. Verse 2 goes on to tell us that when Jesus Christ appears we shall See him like he is um, and be made like him. Be made like him. When we truly stop and meditate on these awesome truths, we should be, as the line of a, a song goes, it maybe we should have chosen this song, we should be truly lost in wonder, lost in praise. You and I will be made like the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity for eternity. And whatever our background, Whatever our sins, and regardless of how the world looks at us, we are all equally, equally precious in God's sight. Negative thoughts and feelings will often beset us. So it's very important we constantly remind ourselves of these these truths and rest in them as well. The glorious truths, the treasures of the gospel. Let's move on to the the picture we see in this passage of being a, a faithful steward. Now, a steward is is someone who's been entrusted with looking after something and and making sure it's used in the right way and not abused or neglected. And we see in verse 1 how Paul speaks of himself and his co-workers, not just as servants of Christ, but also those entrusted with the secret things of God. Referring to God's word and the message of salvation through Jesus. And we too... We too have been entrusted with this treasure, not to keep it locked away, but to proclaim it openly to a corrupt and dying world. In Romans 1, verse 14 to 16, Paul says, I am bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, first for the Jew, and then, thankfully, for the Gentile. Now, the word bound has the meaning of being obligated, a sense of, I must do this, whatever the cost, I must do this. And, of course, a steward must prove faithful, trustworthy, as we see in verse 
to there. The world wants success and strives after this, but God, in his word, tells us to be faithful. We need to read it, of course, to study it, to listen to it, to pray on it, and we strive with God's help to obey it. We treat it seriously, and we learn from it, and referring to Romans 12, verse 2, we have our minds transformed by it to develop a Christian mindset for all spheres of life. Not departmentalised, all spheres of life. And we must imitate the example of Paul in verse 6a. If we just turn to that again, just the first part of verse 6. Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Like Paul, we do these things not just for our own benefit, not just for our own growth, but for the benefit of others too. And this involves proclaiming, sharing the word of God with others as often as we have opportunity and seeking those opportunities. And still in verse 6, Paul wants the Corinthian church to understand the meaning of what it means to not go beyond, or do not go beyond what is written. And this relates to the Understanding, understanding the boundaries of scripture, what it's saying, what it's not saying. It also relates to not adding to or taking away from scripture or ignoring bits that the world doesn't like. In our culture now, in this country, the, the world is, is we're, we're trying to be squeezed to not talk, mention certain parts of scripture. We, we mustn't... Uh, give in to that, that pressure, as it were. Um, we should all, of course, want to be full of Jesus, full of his spirit, but this one's parallel to being full of and gaining fullness in the truth of God's word. For we live in spirit and in truth. Let's move on to the third picture we see in this passage, that of being a spectacle. Let's read verses 8 to 10 again. Verse 8, already you have all you want, already you have become rich, you have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings, so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. Now, the Corinthians had a foolish and an immature pride and belief that they somehow spiritually arrived um, and that they had all their need. But Paul contrasts this with what it truly means to be an authentic follower of Christ in a hostile and rebellious world. He's saying that when we become a worker for God, as opposed to a passive believer keeping their faith to themselves, will become the object of the unflattering gaze of, of the world, or certainly some in the world. He uses the dramatic picture of enemy soldiers being humiliated in the victory parade, soldiers who, who would almost certainly be killed after that humiliation. That's quite a stark illustration to use, I would say. Being a spectacle to angels, of course, as well as to men. So forget the false prosperity gospel. Forget teaching that the Christian life will be an untroubled bed of roses. After all, Jesus told us, I think Mark Grant mentioned this last week, uh, at some point that Jesus told us in John 16.33 that in this world we will have trouble. I think it was C.S. Lewis who described Christians as strangers in an enemy-occupied world. 1 John 5.19 says the whole world is under God's sovereignty, of course, under control of the evil one. So you can see where he was coming from. We are strangers in an enemy-occupied world. Just look at what Paul and his co-workers suffered and believers through the ages to this very day suffer. Let's read verse 10 again, but through to verse 13 this time. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured, 
to this very hour. We go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. There is a price to pay for discipleship. And we should also consider the responses to some of this that Paul and his friends showed there. When they were cursed, they blessed. When they were persecuted, they endured it. When they were slandered, they answered kindly. What an example. How otherworldly. But this is, of course, the way of Christ that comes from full surrender to God. And it needs a daily and willing denial of self, a willingness to take up our cross too. And of course, to imitate Jesus, the holy, spotless, eternal son of the living God, as we've already mentioned, willingly became man, willingly was made a spectacle and hung on a cross on public display. The fourth picture we see is that of family love demonstrated. And this will, of course, overlap strongly with that of being a servant. And Paul's genuine and deep love for the Corinthian church is very evident. Indeed, through Acts and through his other letters as well, you can see uh, consistently through that his amazing sacrificial love for other believers and the price he was willing to pay for them. It's quite a challenge to us, his example. In verse 17, we see how he was willing to send Timothy, a young man Paul loved and considered as his son. Now, it's easy to miss the depth of what this actually meant for Paul, to forsake the companionship, the help, the love, by sending him to Corinth. This was sacrificial giving indeed. And we saw earlier how Paul was willing to suffer on behalf of the Corinthian church and elsewhere in different letters we, we see examples of that, being flogged, being imprisoned, being shipwrecked and so on and so forth. So the challenge to us is do we give to God and to one another, we could say, as the family of believers, do we give him the best of our lives? Or do we give him the equivalent of the, the lame, the blind, the sick, sacrificial animals that some of the Old Testament Jews were guilty of doing? Or to use a more modern um, phrase, do we just give him the fag ends of our lives? Or the leftovers? Or are we obedient to Romans 12, verse 2, that tells us, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies, your whole life, as living sacrifices? holy and pleasing to God. As believers, we must, we must imitate the abounding generosity of God who through Christ gave so much for us, us who deserve only his judgment and just punishment. We must continually develop and nurture generous spirits and not just have a Scrooge-like attitude to our time, our money, skills and energy. For again, this is the way of Christ. And of course, we mustn't forget the global family either. I think if you were here last Sunday morning or watched online, Bob touched on this when he spoke. We mustn't forget the global family. That could be meaning thinking and praying on those on the mission field. But let's not forget a huge, huge number of family members facing terrible, terrible persecution for Christ's sake. I haven't got time to go into all the many details of that. But, you know, getting behind these brothers and sisters also involves sacrifice. We can give financially, which for some, although not for all, of course, but for some, that will be the easy part. Making an effort to read about the many trials they go through, to find out, and then giving time to pray on these can be hard. It can bring, it can bring us in tears, praying, when we go into the depth of what some of these brothers and sisters are suffering. So there is sacrifice in that, supporting other family members. But it's spiritually good for us to do that. We grow too. And of course, 
It is being obedient to scripture, to remember those who are suffering as we too, as if we too are suffering, those in prison as if we too were imprisoned, and other passages of scripture too. So to draw, sorry, losing my place here. Yeah, to draw to a close, authentic Christian living involves having that servant heart, being willing to live a servant of Christ first, and then, of course, to one another in the church, locally and globally, and those outside the church too. Do you remember that original meaning of the word, servant? Are you willing to be a galley slave, an under rower? It also involves being a faithful, a trustworthy steward of God's word, to take on the responsibilities of, of, of this. So let's not neglect this precious resource in our individual or corporate life. And of course, we must be prepared and expect to be a spectacle for Christ, to be willing for Christ's sake, to follow him, whatever the temporal cost may be. As we touched on earlier, many may think such a cost is just too high. I mean, why would anyone want to pay such a price to devote time and reading, studying God's word when we're doing so many other things, to be a lowly servant and to be willingly suffer, to be a spectacle before the world, to be thought of as a fool? Why would anyone want to do that? Well, believers in the Lord Jesus through the ages have been willing to pay this transient cost because of the inexpressible treasure that is ours in the gospel. Because regarding sin, we know forgiveness from its penalty and we can experience the power to overcome sin and, sin and temptation now. And ultimately, because in eternity, we will enjoy the inexpressible freedom from its presence forever and ever in us and around us. Because we become children of God, as we mentioned earlier, and know his immeasurable love and know that despite what we are, what we have done, we are his precious possession. Nothing in all creation will take us, uh, separate us from the love of Christ. Because we know for all these things, peace with and peace from God. And because we're set free from tra chasing all the transient and foolish things the world chases after, from the futility of chasing the wind, and because we have eternal life with God and will be made like Jesus to possess perfect resurrection bodies that never age, never get ill, never wear out. And renewed hearts and minds, of course, as well. And perfected hearts and minds. But again, coming back to this, this, this theme, um, I, I wonder sometimes if the, if the commands and principles of God's word seem perhaps remote or too hard for some modern Western believers. If that's the case, then maybe the problem is it's us who've become removed from the teaching and patterns of New Testament Christian living. There's a challenge there to us as well. Perhaps we've taken our eyes off Jesus and his word and example and have them a little bit too much set on the things of, of the world. Let's not be such a people as that, but let's be a people that always keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus and who have always that eternal perspective. And remember, we don't do it alone. Jesus asked the Father to send the believers, the Holy Spirit, to teach and rebuke and correct and lead us into truth and righteous living. We do not do it alone. And on that, that vein of not doing it alone, let's not forget the fourth picture. We have one another. We don't do these things alone because of the family of believers. So individually and corporately, let's, let's seek to, to consistently demonstrate true family love, Christ-like family love. And again, returning to that theme, if, if finally, if you think you're someone who thinks the cost is just too high, you're not sure, doing a sort of a balance sheet of whether it's worth following Christ, or not, and you, maybe you're leaning more to preferring the cl to clamour after the things of this world, to following Christ, then remember you're just chasing the wind. And you may seemingly catch it. 
you may seemingly possess it for a while and fleetingly enjoy the pleasures and sins of the world. But in the light of eternity, no sooner have you grasped it, as I said earlier, no sooner do they slip away from you. Consider these stern words of Jesus in Matthew 16, 25 and 26. Jesus speaking, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a person if they gain the whole world, yet forfeits their soul? He offers life in abundance and life in eternity, free from all suffering and all sin, a life where we'll be made like him forever, to worship, love and serve perfectly and to enjoy God forever. So the question is, if you're wrestling with these things, would you forsake all of this for simply trying to catch the wind for the transient things of the world? Today, God invites such, as, such people as that to seek him while he may be found, to call on him while he is near. But don't put this off, of course, if you fall into that category. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that really does teach us, but also rebukes us and corrects us, Lord. May we always be open to that, Lord, and trains us so that, that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we pray this for us tonight and all days, Father. Help us to be willing to be servants, to be the under rower. Help us to, to grow in the meaning of what it means to be stewards of your holy word of truth and of life, Father, and be, to be willing to share in the fellowship of Christ's suffering, to be willing to be a spectacle for his sake, Father. And also, Father, to show that family love, to demonstrate it one to another, Lord, to be servants of one another in love, and in truth, Father, and all these things, may you be glorified, Father, and may you use us fruitfully for your kingdom. For we ask all these things in that precious name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>